Welcome to the fourth lecture on this rheology course. The first three lectures, we've spent a lot of time looking at theory. We've reminded ourselves of various Newtonian flow scenarios. We've introduced the same flow scenarios for the power law fluid. And then we went on to look at more flexible, generalised constitutive models, the Corot and the Corot-Yacidar fluid. All of these constitutive equations, whether Newtonian or generalised Newtonian, need values of material parameters, viscosities, power law indices, transition parameters, and so on and so forth. So what we're going to look at this lecture and in next lecture are experimental ways that we can characterise unknown fluids. We're going to introduce the capillary rheometer, which is why we've been looking at pipe flow, and that's something we're going to do this lecture. In the second part of this lecture, we're going to look at the rotational rheometer, which is why we've been looking at Kuwait flow. Next lecture, we're going to look at a different type of rheometry, which is all around extensional and elongational rheometry, which is why back in lectures one and two, we went through all that horrible tensor algebra to get expressions for stresses in different parts of the stress tensor. Let's start with capillary rheometry. We're going to examine a basic capillary rheometer to start with and show you what it is that we set in terms of machine conditions and what it is that we measure to get our experimental data. And we're going to look at an evolution of this concept that's actually a very neat and very flexible experimental platform and one that was pioneered here in Cambridge by Professor Malcolm Mackley, who was my PhD advisor and founder of this rheology course in the first place. So let's start by looking at the basics of capillary rheology. On the blackboard in front of you, I've put a schematic diagram of a very, very basic capillary rheometer. And it is in fact an extruder. You can imagine this being a glorified syringe that can just be heated up to high temperature, so you can melt polymers, and withstand high pressures, so you can characterize really viscous fluids. The elements of the device are very simple. You have a piston which is shown in black. That piston moves downwards and compresses the material which is shown in yellow and forces it through a very narrow capillary. We have a means of measuring pressure drop roughly across that capillary. Now the thing to note is typically capillaries are small and practical pressure measuring devices are quite big, especially those that have to withstand high pressure. And so there's a slight difference between the pressure that is developed across the capillary and the pressure that you measure with a transducer because you also measure some of the entry flow field, which is highly elongational. We'll look in the second part of this lecture how we correct for that, but please just bear that in mind for the time being. So, in this simple embodiment of a capillary rheometer, we actually need a lot of material because every measurement that we make at a given wall shear rate, capillary wall shear rate, remember, is our reference, we need to push the piston down at different speeds to generate different volumetric flows. So, it's an open system, we need a large amount of material, which is fine if you have a large amount of material available. However, for novel polymer architectures or small amounts of expensive fluids, this isn't really suitable. And so enter the concept of a multipass capillary rheometer. The animation there on the blackboard is a basic schematic principle of the multipass rheometer. Now you have two pistons shown in blue. These move up and down and they push a fluid in pink to and fro through a constriction or a capillary of known geometry. You have two pressure measurement devices that measure how those pressures are developed depending on which way the pistons are moving. And you can make these devices really quite small, which is great, which means that you can use a small amount of, for example, an experimental polymer architecture synthesized by chemists, rather than made industrially, to see what its rheology is like. I've now put on the board a few labels on this diagram. There's your upper barrel sitting on top of your test section, sitting on top of your lower barrel. Within the upper barrel, shown in blue, you have your upper piston, which can either move up or down. 
and in the lower barrel you have the lower piston again which can either move up or down. Typically the upper and lower pistons are moved synchronously but they can also be moved asynchronously in antiphase, for example compressing a fluid if you've got a bubbly liquid, a foaming polymer, or expanded again if you've got a polymer in which gas is dissolved and you want to lower the pressure to foam it. The middle test section in most multipass rheometers is very interchangeable. You can put in a capillary, you can put in an orifice as I've illustrated here, you can put in a visual flow path so you can see what's going on in the fluid and in the more advanced devices you can also put in an x-ray um, section as well so you can look at phenomena for example flow induced crystallization. You measure the pressure across the test section. Again, the pressure transducers are large, typically, compared with either the orifice or the capillary. And again, these data need correcting in order to get you accurate material parameters. Let's have a look at a few experiments that you can do with a multipass rheometer that go beyond just measuring pressure drops. So, on the blackboard now, I've put the same diagram of the multipass rheometer. But now I've included a camera, a lamp, and I've highlighted that middle area, which includes an orifice, as an observation region. So what we have are quartz glass windows through which we shine light and can observe what's going on in a fluid. If your fluid is single phase, you're not going to really see much unless, for example, you seed the particles, seed the fluid with particles so you can visualise what the flow field looks like. Or if you use polarised light, and what's known as a stress birefringent polymer, so you can visualise what the stress field looks like. That's a very powerful thing to do, and allows you to test new viscoelastic constitutive equations very accurately, because you can use a constitutive equation to predict a stress field, and then you can observe the stress field experimentally and compare the two. With multiphase fluids, it's a lot easier. You can simply use light in bright field, and observe. So what I've now put on the blackboard are some beautiful images from a research project I was running with an emeritus prof and a postdoc a few years ago of what happens to a single bubble in a very viscous liquid as that bubble flows upwards through a constriction. So the big black bars you can see in these three photographs are the orifice, the bright region is the observation region which is our fluid, and the black entity above the orifice is a bubble started off life as a perfectly spherical bubble below the orifice and as the fluid moves upwards the bubble elongates into the orifice as the pressure changes and then as your flow field diverges you can see how that flow field divergence affects the bubble shape and it's a beautifully elegant experiment to see some very interesting features of how for example bubbly liquids deform as they pass through orifices. And of course this has great practical significance if you think of foam injection moulding and the resultant structure of the foam you end up with which directly impacts its material properties such as thermal conductivity or impact resistance. Now I've changed the diagram of the multipass rheometer yet again. I've removed the light source and included an x-ray source, typically a copper K alpha accelerator, and I've removed the optical camera and replace it with an x-ray camera. Now, this is an incredibly useful setup if you're looking at molten polymers that are subject to crystallization. Polyethylene, for example, one of the first man-made polymers produced initially in the 1930s by ICI, is subject to flow-induced crystallization. And so, if you have order in a flow, you can use x-ray diffraction to probe that order. And so here we have an experimental setup which is very adaptable in terms of the temperature you can set, the shear rate and shear rate history you can set, and you can examine the effect of both of those parameters on the extent of crystallinity that then results. The cartoon on the right hand side of the board shows you approximately what an x-ray diffraction pattern looks like. You have a black dot in the middle, which is where your beam stop is, otherwise you fry your camera with a powerful source of x-rays. And the diffraction pattern is that halo of orange around the beam stop. If you look at the sun in the sky, when there's very, very high cirrus clouds, which are ice crystals, you can see a halo around the sun. 
This is a similar principle. That sun halo is a result of light diffraction due to ice crystals in Altus Cirrus. Here we have X-ray diffraction as a result of ordering crystallinity within a polymer. As we move to that bottom cartoon image, we see I've put two yellow blobs at the 90 and 270 degree position. Those blobs are a schematic diagram of what you see if you suddenly get an orientation of flow order. And so you can pick up the signature of crystallinity and of ordering of species in the X-ray pattern. And so when you consider this can be done in a very controlled flow environment, you've suddenly moved away from just having a rheometer that can measure pressure drop through to a rheometer that can give you stress field information visually, that can give you visual information about flow fields and flow deformation and two-phase flow. And you can get crystallinity data as well with X-ray diffraction. A very, very powerful set of experimental measurements. So, some quick key points. Capillary rheometers can be open, basically extruders, or closed, such as the Cambridge multipass rheometer. What we're going to do is place an arbitrary fluid into these devices and we need to be able to work out apparent viscosity for an arbitrary fluid. We'll see how to do this in the next section of this lecture. I've talked a little bit about the multipass rheometer and how it's a very flexible experimental platform that can be used with visual systems and with x-ray systems which yields a wealth of useful experimental data.